Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the response to JW Comments, Question and Objections playlist of this YouTube channel and is entitled Episode 11. Let us begin. All right, this is in reference to a recent comment I got from a Jehovah Witness in response to my apologetics to the Jehovah Witness into your hands video. Let's read it. This is no problem for JWs. It doesn't prove a trinity at all. It doesn't prove Jesus to be Jehovah God either. The account of Stephen teaches that after Jesus died, resurrected, ascended back to heavens, Jehovah God had empowered Jesus Christ to do all the resurrections going forward. Stephen was well aware of that, for before dying, Jesus stated what is recorded at John 5, 25 to 29. Well, I don't know of any particular uh, 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 Bible verse that says exactly what is stated there, but let's look into this. And let's look at the account of Stephen. This is all from JW.org, the New World Translation, Acts 7, verses 58 to 60. After throwing him, Stephen, outside the city, they began stoning him. The witnesses laid down their outer garments at the feet of a young man called Saul, who obviously was a Pharisee uh, taught by Gamaliel, who was persecuting the Christians and, of course, later had his conversion and became the Apostle Paul, the uh, preacher to the world. As they were stoning Stephen, he made this appeal, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The point of the last video was, in the Old Testament, we are taught that the only one who receives the spirit of a true believer is Jehovah God. And notice who Stephen's calling out to. Is he calling out to the Father? No, he's calling out to Lord Jesus in heaven and ask him to receive his spirit. Why? Because Lord Jesus is also Jehovah God, because otherwise there's a contradiction. Then kneeling down, he cried out with a strong voice, Jehovah, do not charge this sin against them. And after saying this, he fell asleep in death. Of course, it doesn't say asleep in death in the Greek. It just says asleep. Here's the other point. So number one, right here, this crushes Watchtower theology on two major points. Number one, Stephen is crying out to the Son of God in heaven to receive his spirit and not to the Father. When we are taught in the Old Testament, that is only the Father receives the Spirit. That's point number one. Here's point number two. Receive my Spirit. He has a Spirit. I thought you as Jehovah Witnesses believe that after you die, you cease to exist and all you are is a body and you'll be recreated later if Jehovah uh, uh, chooses to do so based on his memories of you. Receive my Spirit. There's a Spirit that left his body and went to heaven. Oh, yeah. That's what we believe. That's not what you believe. So this reinforces again our belief system and destroys yours. So just that point right there proves two things. That the Lord Jesus Christ is doing something in the New Testament that we are taught that only Jehovah does in the Old Testament. And then Stephen is releasing his spirit that leaves his body as it falls asleep and goes to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. Okay, right there, Watchtower Theology is done twice. Let's continue though. You brought up the Gospel John. Let's, get, you know, of John chapter 5, which we'll get to. But before we get to it, let's just go through some previous cha chapters and some subsequent chapters to, again, completely destroy your wicked, false theology. I mean, how dare you bring up the Gospel of John? Let's just start with the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, right? And the Word was a God. Now, it doesn't say that in the Greek, but guess what? It's better than that. It has nothing to do with, and the word was God versus the word was a God. Let's go to your preferred Greek translation. The Greek, your Greek interlinear, your Greek manuscript. What does it say in your Greek manuscript? Enarchi in ologos, que ologos in prostanteon, que theos in ologos. It says, and God was the word. It doesn't say... And the word was God, or the word was a God. It says, Que theos in ologos, and God was the word. Wow. So you don't even read your own Greek interlinear, because in the very first verse it says, God was the word. God was the word. I could just keep repeating it, but I'll continue. Now let's look at John 1, 9 through... 14. 
the true light that gives light to every sort of man was about to come into the world, obviously Jesus Christ. He was in the world, and the world came into existence through him, but the world did not know him. He came to his own home, but his own people did not accept him. However, to all who did receive him, he gave authority to become God's children because they were exercising faith in his name, and they were born not from blood or from a fleshy will or from man's will, but from God, from the will of God, which is what? To see the Son, to believe upon him, and later he will grant you eternal life, again, eternal life, eternal life, everlasting life. We'll get to that in John 3, um, and, uh, and later raise you bodily on the last day. Let's look at that. They were born. Remember, what do you guys believe as Christ being the firstborn? You think born means didn't exist before that point. So if Christ indeed was born before creation, he existed before creation. Look at these people. Look at the definition of born. These individuals are born not from blood or from a fleshy will or from man's will, but from God. So they become children of God. Now, if your definition of what born means, meaning you did not exist before that point, who were these people before they became God's children? Before they became sons and daughters of God? Before they be, uh, were born of the will of God? According to your definition of what born means, they didn't exist, and of course they did exist. So that completely annihilates what born even means. It does not mean did not exist before. Christ was born at creation or before creation, right? What does that mean? He, did, he existed prior to that point, meaning he existed prior to creation, meaning he's uncreated, meaning he's God. John 2. Therefore, in response, the Jews said to him, Christ, what sign can you show us since you are doing these things when he was, when he was you know, getting rid of the, the money changers and those who sold oxen and sheep and doves at the temple? Jesus replied to them, tear down this temple and in three days I will raise it up. That's what Christ says. Tear down this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 20. The Jews then said, this temple was built in 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? So they understood who was saying that he's going to raise the temple, him. But he was talking about the temple of his body. Oh, so what does this prove? He will raise his body. What do you say? No, no, no. He didn't raise it. Only the Father did. He didn't exist. And it wasn't his body anyway. Again, how wicked can this be? When they were, he was raised up from the dead, the disciples recalled that he used to say this. So he said this many times. He used to say this. So he said this many times. I will raise the temple of my body. So it's reported here in John 19 through 21, but according to 22, he said it many times not recorded. So yeah, he just refused to accept what Jesus stated. I'll do this again, forgive me, to show an illustration of, of, of your ridiculousness. Let's say a father and a son together build a temple, which is what happened. Together, not one, not the other. If the son initially said that he built the temple, would he be telling the truth? That's what we just read in John 2. Yes. If we were told later that the father built the temple, would this also be the truth as we were told in Acts 5, Acts 13, and Galatians 1? Yes. Now, if the son said that he built the temple by himself, would he be telling the truth? No. Did he say that? Did he say in John 2, I will build this temple of my body by myself? He didn't say that. And if we were later told that the Father built the temple by himself, would this be the truth? But again, show me Acts 5, show me Acts 13, show me Galatians 1 where it says that Jesus' temple of his body, or his body, or Jesus, was erected only by the Father and not by the Son in any way whatsoever. That's not stated either. Let's continue, John 3. Verses 14 through 17. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone believing in him may have everlasting life. Everlasting life. Everlasting means it's never taken from you. It can't be taken away. But again, you guys think when this body dies, you cease to exist until later, possibly, Jehovah, based on his memories of you and his mercy, recreates you. That's not everlasting life. Verse 16, reiterated, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone exercising faith in him might not be destroyed but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to the world to him, for him to judge the world, but for the world to be saved through him. Now, Christ will judge the world, but what was God's purpose? That everyone would be saved and they wouldn't need to be judged, right? They'll receive the mercy. 
everlasting life, another watchtower, satanic false teaching, just devastated. John 5. Therefore, in response, Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, the Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever things that one does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Huh. So for whatever things the Father does, the Son does in the same way. Huh. So the Father's omnipotent can do anything, and therefore the Son is omnipotent and can do anything. I'm sorry, if you're omnipotent, you're God. Jesus is God. If it doesn't make sense to you, who cares if it makes sense to you? You explain to me how a sperm and an egg made me, and at a different time a sperm and egg made you, and here we are talking to each other. Explain that to me, please, because you can't and neither can I, and you're going you're gonna to define what God is. God's telling us. Omnipotence is a feature, a characteristic, a trait of God. Verse 20, For the Father has affection for the Son and shows him all the things he himself does and will show him works greater than these so that you may marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead up and makes them alive, so the Son also makes alive whomever he wants to. For the Father judges no one at all, but he has entrusted all the judging to the Son. What are we taught in the Old Testament? In Jeremiah, Jehovah does all the judging. What is this state right here? The Son does all the judging. How does that make sense? Because the Son is Jehovah as well, just not the Father. So that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You do not honor the Father. You don't even listen to what Christ says. Christ says, I will raise the temple of my body. No, 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 Christ. No, no, no. You're not going to do it, and it's not going to be your body. Oh, but we honor you. You do, do not honor the Son. You do not honor the Father. Wicked. And notice this, 21. Just as the Father raises the dead up and makes them alive, so the Son also makes alive whomever he wants to. Does it say whomever else? Whomever he wants to other than himself? That's the word of God. That's what it says. You do not honor the Son. You do not honor the Father. You do not honor the Scripture. Continuing, 25. Most truly I say to you, the hour is coming, and it is now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who have paid attention will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted also to the Son to have life in himself. The Son has life in himself. He is life, and you're telling me he didn't exist for three days. Impossible. He is life. He has it within himself. He is a fountain of life, a never-ending fountain of life. Verse 27, and he has given him authority to do judging because he is the son of man, again, making him Jehovah based on what Jeremiah teaches us. Do not be amazed at this, for the hour is coming which all those in the memorial tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who did good things to a resurrection of life and those who practice vile things to a resurrection of judgment. Well, guess what? Christ's corruptible physical body heard the voice of the eternal son of God and rose. Does it say there? No, 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 no. Not all those, all those other than Jesus. No, no, who did good things? Oh, no, Christ didn't do good things. Oh, you, what is this? John 10. And we have the Greek to the right. This is why the Father loves me, because I surrender my life. Notice no one took it from him. He gave it up. They put, they scourged him. They whipped him. They put a crown of thorns on him, right? He gave up his life. It is finished. And he gave up the spirit that went to the Father. No, no, no. It was destroyed. It's another. I didn't mention that verse, but it's, it's so ridiculous. Anyway, notice he surrenders his life. He actively gave it up so that I may receive it again. Receive. See, the receive sounds passive, doesn't it? 18, no man takes it away from me. See, I surrender it of my own initiative. Notice activity. I give it up actively. I have authority to surrender it, and I have authority, again, to receive it again. This commandment I received from my father. See, receiving it seems kind of weak. What's the Greek? I receive lavo to receive lavin. Now, in different translation, when it has the lavin, it's to take, not to receive. Notice to take is more active. I surrender it. I take it. Let's look at that uh, verb, lambano, to take or receive. Here's the problem. It's active, it's aggressive, it's accepting with initiative and assertiveness. It's not passive. So even if you want to translate as receive, it's grab hold of it. I took it. 
I, I didn't just receive it. The Father didn't plop it into my hand. I grabbed it out of his hand. Yes, I received it from the Father, but I actively did so. I was involved, just like he said in John 2. John 10. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice and I know them. They follow me. I give them everlasting life yet again and they will by no means ever be destroyed and no one will snatch them out of my hand. What my father has given me is something greater than all other things and no one can snatch them out of the hand of my father. Notice the sheep are the son, to the son and the father equivalently. Okay, they're one in power. They're one in dominion. Verse 31, once again, the Jews picked up stones to stone them. Jesus replied to them, I displayed you many fine works from the Father. For which of those works are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, we are stoning you not for fine work, but for blasphemy. For you, although being a man, make yourself a God. So they understood when Christ said, I and the Father are one, he's declaring himself God. Now you brought up this in another comment to me that Jehovah Witnesses sent the first comment. That, oh, the Father in one here, and in 17, it's all the same thing, right? Because, you know, the, the, the disciples are going to be one, so it's all the same. So what Christ said in 1030 is equivalent to what we're going to go over here. So John 17, 20 to 24. I make requests not concerning these only, talking about his disciples, but also concerning those putting faith in me through their word, so that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in union with me, and I am in union with you, that they also may be in union with us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them glory that you have given me, in order that they may be one, just as we are one. I am in union with them, and you in union with me, in order that they may be perfected into one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and that you love me, or you love them just as you love me. So they're in one in purpose. And, and what's the whole purpose of them being one is, let's look at 24. Father, I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am in order that they may look upon my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the founding of the world. So their whole purpose is they'll be together to eventually give glory to the Son. So comparing the way they're one, comparing that to John 10.30 is ludicrous. This is one in purpose, working together, to do the will of the Father, which is what? All may see the Son, believe upon the Son, and the Son will give them everlasting life and raise them on the last day. That's why they're one, to assist the Son in spreading the gospel. The Father sent the Son, and now the Son will send them. Finishing it off here, John 20. Well, eight days later, his disciples were again indoors, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and he stood in their midst and said, May you have peace. Next, he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands of my body. Take your hands, stick them to the side, my side of my body, and stop doubting, but believe. Why don't you do it? In answer, Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Huh? What is that in the Greek? O kyrios mu theos mu, the Lord of me and the God of me. Beautiful. He's calling Christ his Lord and his God. That's what's happening, right? Um, no, 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 no. He's just amazed. Well, then he's taken the name of Jehovah in vain, and Christ should have corrected him. He wasn't taking the name of Jehovah in vain. He was calling Christ Jehovah. O kyrios mu, kyrios Lord, Jehovah, is how that was in, in the Greek. Ke o theos mu. It's, it's right in your face. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. So I don't know what to tell you. I think you should never, ever use the Gospel of John to, you know, to, to support your, your wicked, Christ-denying, Christ-glory-stealing, um, uh, satanic theology. I pray I spoke truth and interpret Holy Scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the listener. All truth comes from God and ears were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I'd greatly appreciate it. If you could like, comment, share it, subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Holy Trinity bless us all.